Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. Come, Holy Spirit, come. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. And I can't say it enough. Alleluia! He is risen! He is risen indeed. Alleluia. If you wouldn't mind turning into your bulletins to look at Luke's gospel, that's where we're going to focus our time. Or... As you know, you can always grab the Pew Bible in front of you, or your own Bibles if you brought them. We start off, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and on the third day rise. The resurrection. How are we to understand what we're being told about the resurrection? That is the question that we are confronted with today. In Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress, there is a beautiful scene where Christian finally arrives at the cross. Now, if you've read it, you will know that he got there through many dangers, toils, and snares. But when he arrives at the cross, the burden on his back, which has been the focus the entire story long thus far, do you know what happens to it? <laughs> One of us knows it. It rolls off Christian's back, doesn't it? It rolls off his shoulders and it rolls down to the hill. And does anyone know where the burden rolls into or what it rolls into? The empty tomb. The empty tomb of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the burden was never to be seen again. My guess is that there are many of you, I say us, many of us, that would give anything to remove some burden that you are currently now carrying. I have to say, you're not the first one to have one, nor will you be the last. But what can we do about these burdens? Well, Luke shows us the answer here in his account of Christ's resurrection. And as we turn there, we're going to see Luke's gospel show us three burdens that the resurrection removes. So the resurrection removes the burden of proof, the burden of sin, and the burden of death. So first, the resurrection removes the burden of proof. As many of you know, the burden of proof is a legal term. It's the standard used in the court of law. And before I go any further, I just want to let you know that I know many of you are attorneys, and so I called one of you this week, and uh, I actually went through my sermon with you to make sure that what I was saying was precise. I see some of you attorneys looking at me and smiling. So anyways, I've, I've verified this. So the burden of proof is a legal standard that requires parties to demonstrate that a claim is either valid or invalid based on the facts and evidence presented. And in the resurrection, we find that the evidence more than satisfies the burden of proof. Or as the Oxford historian Thomas Arnold put it, I know of no one fact in the history of mankind which is proved better and fuller, proved by better and fuller evidence than the death and resurrection of Christ. So there you have it. You have an Oxford historian telling you that, but let's look at the evidence, shall we? And my favorite, and the, oh, the first one you have to go to, is the empty tomb. So the question comes, why is the tomb empty? And so there are many theories as to what happened. You know, some people say, well, the disciples stole it. You know, they're the ones that came up with this, this whole myth of the resurrection. But, you know, it doesn't really follow, because if you watch what happens to their lives, They end up getting beaten, arrested, flogged, and all of them, with the exception of John, who is exiled on the island of Patmos, they all die horrible martyrs' deaths. And what we know from history is that when there is a known lie and people are confronted with it on the risk of death, you know what people do? They confess. But to a T, none of the disciples did that. No, they went to their deaths proclaiming that they saw that their Redeemer lived. Okay, so it doesn't make sense that they would take it. Well, maybe it was the Jewish leaders, the Jewish authorities, right? But there again, if anybody wanted to find the body of Jesus, do you know who it was? It was the Jewish leaders. Why? Because you could snuff out this, this nasty little Judas or uh, Jewish sect called Christianity, this thing that was taking off 
right, leading all the Jews away from Judaism. So they have all people who want the body, but they never were able to find it. Okay, well, the Romans then. The Romans have it. But wait a second. Do you know who was guarding the tomb? The Romans. Do you know what probably happened to the Romans that were guarding the tomb? They were probably killed because the body was removed, right? And so they have all people too. They would want to have it. And so that begs the question, where is the body? You see why this is so important? You see why it is uh, so trustworthy? But that's just the first piece of evidence. The next are the witnesses. Now, Christ, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, when he's talking about the resurrection, he says that Jesus revealed himself to 500 people at once. Now, you can say, you know, some of the resurrection uh, appearances, that might have been a hallucination, right? People do hallucinate. But have you ever heard of 500 people hallucinating at once? No. No, you don't. And Paul is inviting people to investigate his claims. He's saying, don't take my word for it. Go and ask them, which is the exact same thing that Luke does. Luke starts naming names. In verse 10, look at this. He says, Joanna. Does anyone know who Joanna is? Just the wife of Herod's administrator. You know, you think you'd, that's probably a well-known person, okay? And then he goes on to name Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James. And he's listing all these people. Why? Well, when you are studying in college, and even now, you read an academic book, and they will have little footnotes, right? And you can look below, and those footnotes tell you something. What do they tell you? The source, They say, don't believe me. This is the guy I'm getting this from, or gal. Go and ask them. And what we see, scholars tell us that this was written, you know, probably a few decades after all these things happened. And so these people were still alive. So these are source citations. Luke, as well as Paul, are saying, don't believe me. Go and ask them for yourselves. Furthermore, back to the witnesses, These disciples had witnessed Jesus die. The Roman authorities, who were experts in death, they confirmed that Jesus was dead. Do you know how they confirmed Jesus was dead? They took a spear, and they speared him, right? And so these guys knew when someone was dead. I mean, they were experts in it, so they're not going to mess that up. And finally, everyone knew where his tomb was. Does anyone know where he was buried? What tomb? Or whose tomb, rather? Joseph of Arimathea, a pretty well-known guy, wealthy, you know, has stature, status. And so these are all people that are known. And so right there, you do away with some of these theories, like the swoon theory. The swoon theory suggests that Jesus didn't really die on the cross. You know, he just kind of passed out. And then he got into the coolness of the cave, and then he revived, right? I won't even go too far down that route because, I mean, can you imagine someone who had survived the scourge? where most people's insides pour out, you know, going around saying, I'm resurrected from the dead. Look, look how great life is. That's not going to convince people. No, the Romans knew when someone died. And so this swoon theory, it doesn't follow the evidence. But nor does the wrong tomb theory. That's another popular one. Well, they just went to the wrong tomb. But again, whose tomb was it? It was Joseph of Arimathea. You see this. And so Luke is very careful to make sure that we don't miss the evidence. But that's not all the evidence, because now we have the church. How can you explain the church taking off like wildfire, both then and even today? There have been a great number of messianic figures that have popped up throughout the ages. But funny thing, do you know what happens to their movements as soon as the messianic figure dies? Their movement dies with it. And go back, look at every movement. There's only one exception. There's only one messianic figure where the church didn't die. It only grew in power. You know which one that is? It's the church of Jesus Christ. Why? Was it because a group of former fishermen, tax collectors, and prostitutes stole the body... (laughs) concocted a story that made them all look like buffoons. And you do realize that, you know, the stuff that you see in here, it's embarrassing. You, put, you don't put that in there, right? I mean, what's so fascinating is that uh, if you're going to come up with a story, you know, you're going to make your, your founders look a little bit better, right? You're going to be like, you know, Peter remembered, oh, yeah, Jesus said that they're going to rise from the dead. You know, I don't care if there's Romans there. I'm going to go there. No, that's not what happened at all. And to a T, everyone, they didn't believe that uh, Jesus was actually alive. I mean, the women brought 
Spices. Why would they bring spices to the tomb? To anoint his dead body. No, they didn't think that he was alive. And they all looked silly. And then all of them willingly died brutal deaths for something they knew to be a lie. This I don't buy. That cannot be. Do you see why the resurrection is the best attested fact in history? If you don't believe in the resurrection, that's your choice. But if you take that position, then you must come up with a better explanation for how the church became what it is. In other words, the burden of proof is on you. And so it's fine to say, I don't believe in the resurrection. But do the intellectually honest thing and search out the answers. Where is the body? How do you explain the church? You see, the burden of proof has been answered. It's been removed by the resurrection. And if you don't believe that, I earnestly encourage you, like so many attorneys have done in the past, to seek out the evidence. And you'll find, too, that it, well, it more than satisfies the burden of proof. How did Christ's followers all move from denying that they knew Christ and denying the resurrection itself to becoming stalwart believers willing to do anything for Christ? How did they move from such grief at his death to such life in just three days' time? The answer is the evidence. They saw that the Redeemer lived, and they saw him face to face. And that leads us to the second burden that the resurrection removes, and it's the burden of sin. Note what the angels say in verse 6. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Well, why do they say that the Son of Man must be delivered, must be crucified, and must rise? Answer, because of our sin issue. Now, upon hearing this, some of you are thinking, no worries, preacher, I've got this under control. I just stay away from sin, right? I don't have any issue at all. You know, I live a pretty good life, right? Some of you are thinking that. We'll get to that in a moment. The other group are thinking, here we go again. We're talking about sin, how archaic. Everyone knows that sin is just a social construct created to make us feel bad. I want you to know that in either of these perspectives, sin ceases to be an issue. Because sin is either avoided or it is eliminated as a fiction. Funny enough, while we have great trouble seeing sin in our own lives, right, We can very clearly see it in the lives of others, can't we? We can see it, you know, from 500 miles off, you know. We look and be like, oh, that sinner. Can you believe that? And then it comes to our own sin, and, well, it's a little bit more complicated, you know. Why is that? Well, what is sin? Sin, at its core, is putting ourselves first. Wanting to be the center. That is, wanting to be God. This was Satan's sin. Just look at his final temptation of Jesus. He said, worship me, and I will give you all the kingdoms of the world. Satan puts the same desire into each of us. And he started in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 3, with Eve. He persuaded her that she could find happiness outside of God by disobeying him. And he does the same thing today. He persuades us that we can be our own masters and that we can find true happiness apart from God. As C.S. Lewis put it, out of this hopeless pursuit has come nearly all that we call human history. Money, poverty, ambition, war, prostitution, classes, empires, slavery, the long, terrible story of man trying to find something other than God which will make him happy. But it simply doesn't exist because we were built to worship God and we will not be satisfied with anything else. We are blind to this reality, though. And that is why Jesus had to come and why he had to be delivered over to be crucified. But then you'll ask, well, why can't God just forgive? I mean, surely the cross wasn't needed. What do you say to that? Well, let me ask you, can you just forgive? What if you loaned a friend $50,000? I don't know about you, but that's, that's a lot of money for me. You loaned a friend $50,000, and then they don't repay you. And not only do they not repay you, but then they start avoiding you, Right? And then they stop responding to your texts and your phone calls. Well, you might say, well, I just forgive them. You see, that ruins your point, preacher. You can't use that. I just forgive them. But 
does that work? Did your forgiveness eliminate the debt of $50,000? No. And if you forgave them, you would be telling them that I'm going to eat the loss. I'm going to incur the loss. You see, in this scenario, there are only one of two options. Number one is you take that loss upon yourself and you say, I don't want to pay it, but I'm going to pay it. Or your friend who is not returning your texts, he is going to have to pay. But what we all know is that that debt is not magically going to disappear, is it? No, somebody is going to have to pay for it. And if that is true for us, how much more true is it of God? And what the resurrection teaches us is that God accepted Jesus' payment on the cross. Do you realize this truth? For if Christ had sinned even once, then he would have gotten what he deserved on the cross because he was a sinner just like you and me. But the resurrection demonstrates that his sacrificial payment was accepted by God. And not only that, but it vindicated all of his claims. Do you realize this? And now some of you hear this and you're like, I'm somewhat following you. You know, I got places to go after this and I was a little late coming in and, you know, uh, I'm a little distracted. So hear this though. Let me give you another illustration. Does anyone shop at Target down the way? You all know what I'm talking about on Roosevelt? Have you noticed recently when you go in either exits, there are employees stationed at the, at the entryways? Have you noticed that? I've not inquired, but do you know why they're there? I have an idea. I mean, the preacher's asking questions again. It's Easter. Come on, preacher. For shoplifting, right? So you get your jug of milk, right, because you've got to make pancakes, and you're walking out, and one of them comes up to you, and they say, hey, you know, what are you doing? What can you show them to, sh- you know, to persuade them that your debt has been paid? Receipt. Your receipt. That's right. And you say, back off, flannel adorned target person. <laughs> Trouble me not. My debt has been paid. There are some of you, like me, that you realize how holy God is. And you know that when you meet him someday, you have sins. And you are afraid to meet God. But do you know what the resurrection gives us? It's God's proclamation to the target guy. Be gone! Trouble me not, sins! Because the resurrection is proof positive that my sins were nailed on the cross and God the Father accepted Christ's sacrifice. Do you see the amen? This is good news. Are you burdened by your sin? If you understand the resurrection, you will will not be. You will simply let it go. Are you enjoying this truth today? That leads us to the final burden. The resurrection removes the burden of death. What did the angel say to the women who came to anoint Jesus' dead body? I love it. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Well, what's their point? Jesus isn't dead any longer. And if he really did rise physically from the dead, well, then that's a game changer, isn't it? Because all of us have this issue. (laughs) Unless Jesus comes back before we die, what's going to happen to us? We're all going to die. But Jesus, being resurrected from the dead, that changes it all. Why? Because what we believe influences how we live. So, for example, if we believe that we came from nothing and we are heading towards nothing, then how will we live? We will live for today because tomorrow is no guarantee. Or as the Apostle Paul put it in his letter on this subject in 1 Corinthians 15, he says, If the dead are not raised... Let us eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. And is that not the Western cultural in a nutshell? I mean, you only live once. You only go around once. Better live for today. Now, many of, now you may not believe in the resurrection, but if you don't, at least do the intellectually honest thing and take your worldview to its logical conclusion. This life is all there is, and it could all be destroyed in a moment. And if that is true, then we are merely consumers, and it doesn't matter how we live. Now, that is not a very hope-inspiring thought, is it? And that's why, even though the culture is caught up in this truth, no one believes it. But we still do find in people, because this is the worldview. We find people clinging to their health, to their wealth, and to their beauty, like a toddler trying to cup water with their hands. But what happens to that water after a while? It's going to slip away. 
just like all the gifts that God have given us. But if Jesus really did rise from the dead, well, then that changes everything, doesn't it? For the resurrection alone gives us hope. As one commentator put it, the resurrection means endless hope, but no resurrection means a hopeless end. I have to stop there for a second because this is what's so crazy. Do you know, there are so many, even churches, that today they don't believe in the physical resurrection of Jesus. How sad a reality is that? Don't fall into that camp. Don't believe me either. Look at the evidence. If the resurrection is true, then it doesn't matter what we face because we can know that this life is not all there is. And again, what we believe influences how we live. Thus, we find all of the disciples giving up their lives and dying horrible deaths for Christ. How can you explain that? How, how can we explain that? Well, there's only one explanation. The resurrection removed the burden of death, and they were able to live life without fear. And I find this funny. I do believe that our God is ironic. He loves irony. Because look at this. The resurrection of Christ is the only thing that can provide what hedonism and self-exploration falsely promise. Namely, the ability to live and enjoy life to the full without fear. That is, to live life without any burdens. Don't you desire that kind of life? A life like Bunyan described of Christian when his burden fell off his back and rolled down the hill into the tomb, never to be seen again? Don't you want that kind of life? I certainly do. And I just want to stop here for another second because right now, I know that a lot of you have burdens and you're like, preacher, you have no idea the burden I'm facing. And a lot of you are tired and you're looking for hope. And I'm telling you, the one thing that will give you hope is the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, uh, let's just be honest. Number one, I just love you all, and so I feel, you know, I feel a connection with you, and so I'll just be really honest with you. This morning at the sunrise service, it's fantastic. I love it. But do you know what I did on a couple of occasions? I messed up my sermon. I stumbled over my words. And do you know what that does to this sinner? Oh, the whole service is botched. It's all over, you know. I can't believe I did that. You know, and I sit and I'm, I'm silent and I'm thinking. And do you know what the Holy Spirit brings to me? Is it your burden? Is it your burden to bring people to Christ? Is it your burden to preach eloquently? Congregation, is it my burden? No! And guess what the resurrection does? It removes that burden. What burden do you have today? Are you tired? Are you wearied? What burden is Jesus whispering into your ear right now and saying, let me take this sucker off your back. <laughs> let me throw it in the tomb so that you can live without fear and without burden. I recognize that for some of you here in this, you're thinking, well, that's great. You found something that works for you. I don't believe that, but we each have to find something that gets us through the day that helps us with life's difficulties. In other words, it's true for you because it works for you. Now, if you believe that, let me just tell you gently, you're closing your mind off to the truth. The resurrection is not true because it works. It works because it's true. To say that it's true because it works is very postmodern, but at the same time, it is philosophically bankrupt. It's like going to the doctor and receiving a surger, surgery that heals you from a terminal disease and then someone saying to you, well, I'm glad that works for you, but, you know, I'm going to stick to positive thinking, you know. I'm going to try that out. No, that's foolish. It's not true because it works. It works because it's true. Do you believe this truth today? I'll tell you who did, Mary, Peter, and the rest of the disciples, and it transformed their lives. The very reason that we're having this conversation is because they believed it. And why did they believe it? Because they saw that their Redeemer lived and their burdens were taken away. Now, some of you out there, you do believe the, tr the truth of the resurrection. That's why you're here. But functionally, you deny it in your daily life. I'm very much guilty of this. I mean, you just heard me a moment ago with my, you know, preaching issues. I get caught up in my plans and my desires, and I get very upset if either of those things get frustrated. Can any of you relate? Maybe it's just me. 
But if we stop and we ask God to quicken our hearts, that is, fill our hearts and souls with his living reality, which is both physically and spiritually true right now, then that will give us his power. Power to face any trouble that comes our way. And it will give us a hope that will never be removed. And so the question before us is this. Are we experiencing this power and this hope today? If not, then let us ask God to quicken our hearts with the truth of Christ's glorious resurrection that all of our burdens might fall away into his tomb so that we too can cry out, Alleluia! He is risen! The Lord is risen indeed! Alleluia! Lord, may this be the cry of all of our hearts, especially this sinful preacher of yours, that you would receive all the glory and you would expand your mighty, glorious, resurrected kingdom. For we ask this in your glorious name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let us stand.